be shown several flight maneuvers. Topics to be covered include straight and level flight, climbing, descending, and turns. The final segment of the tape will have a discussion of range and endurance. First, straight and level flight. An aircraft is in straight and level flight when it is holding a steady direction with the wings laterally level at a constant altitude. You achieve straight and level flight by the coordinated use of all three flight controls. The amount of effort and coordination to keep the aircraft level will vary according to how rough the flying conditions are. The aircraft should be in the cruise attitude which can be established by visually fixing the relationship of the wingtips and nose with the horizon. Cruise attitude assumes the wings are level with the horizon. To maintain straight flight, the wings of the aircraft must be kept laterally level by using the ailerons. Remember, if the aircraft banks, it turns in the direction of the lower wing. Use the rudder to control yaw. You recall yaw is created by the bank attitude, slipstream and asymmetric thrust, and power changes. Increasing the power yaws the aircraft to the left. Decreasing it yaws it to the right. Anticipate yaw and immediately correct it with the appropriate use of the rudder. To maintain a constant heading, point the aircraft in the direction you want to go. Then you may use the heading indicator as a cross-reference. As always, keep a vigilant lookout for other aircraft. To maintain level flight, use the elevators to compensate for any changes in pitch and maintain a constant altitude. While in straight and level flight, if the power is increased, the nose will pitch up. Conversely, a decrease in power causes the nose to pitch down. Therefore, to stay level, you must lower the nose when you increase the power and raise it if you decrease the power. It is important to realize early in your flight training the interdependence of the cockpit controls. This is best summed up in the maxim, attitude plus power equals aircraft performance. While at cruise attitude, changes in power settings affect both the speed and altitude, as does pressure on the control column. Therefore, if you are changing airspeed, it is necessary to simultaneously adjust the throttle and elevator controls. If you want to reduce airspeed while in straight and level flight, decrease your RPMs smoothly. At the same time, apply enough back pressure on the control column to maintain your altitude. You must keep the wings level. You will notice that as airspeed decreases, the need for a greater back pressure on the column increases. Once you reach the desired airspeed, adjust the power setting as necessary and then retrim the aircraft. To increase airspeed while in straight and level flight, smoothly advance the throttle while pushing forward on the control column to maintain level flight. Keep the wings level and once you've reached the desired airspeed, make necessary adjustments to the power setting and trim your aircraft. Increasing and decreasing airspeed while in straight and level flight has an important application. It will help you maintain correct spacing with other aircraft in the airport traffic circuit. The next maneuver you'll be shown is climbing. When an aircraft climbs, there are changes in its attitude, airspeed, altitude, rate of climb indications, and generally, its power settings. As you climb, your forward visibility is reduced. More about that in a moment. First, some definitions. Climbs may be carried out at different speeds. These are specified in the aircraft operating manual. One is the recommended normal climb speed. This is the speed you climb at under normal circumstances. It is higher than the best rate of climb and best angle of climb speeds, which will be defined in a moment. Its advantages are better forward visibility and adequate cooling for the engine. The recommended best rate of climb speed will give you the greatest gain in altitude in the shortest time. You would use this when you must reach a given altitude in the shortest possible time. You would use the recommended best angle of climb speed in a situation where there are obstacles in the takeoff path. It gives you the greatest gain in altitude in a given distance. Keep in mind that during the best angle of climb and best rate of climb speeds, it's possible to overheat the engine. Resume the normal climb speed as soon as possible. Finally, there are en route climb speeds. These are carried out at various airspeeds between the normal climb and normal cruise speed. 
Convenience and comfort are the main reason for using this type of climb, since there are no time or distance limitations to concern yourself with. Before going through the procedure for a climb, some points to consider. Earlier on the tape, you were told about the tendency of the aircraft to yaw at high power settings due to propeller slipstream. Keep the wings level and use the rudder to control yaw. And before you begin a climb, look out for other aircraft in the area, especially ahead of you. As you begin to climb, your forward visibility is limited. You may not see aircraft at the same altitude or below. In long climbs, it's advisable to frequently change your heading by at least 20 degrees to give you a chance to look for other air traffic in the sky. As well, lower the nose slightly to give you a better lookout for traffic ahead. For a normal climb, place the aircraft in a nose-up attitude that you estimate will maintain normal climbing airspeed. Increase power and trim the aircraft to maintain the climb. As you gain experience, you will find yourself operating the flight and power controls in a simultaneous coordinated manner. Adjust the attitude to achieve the desired airspeed. Recheck the power setting and make necessary adjustments so you can maintain the climb attitude without having to put pressure on the column. Look at the instrument panel and note the steady increase in height on the altimeter and the steady rate of climb on the vertical airspeed indicator. Again, it cannot be stressed enough to keep a good lookout for other aircraft while you climb. Once you have reached the desired altitude, you will return to straight and level flight. First, put the aircraft in a normal cruise attitude. Accelerate to normal cruising speed, but be careful not to exceed the maximum RPM. Reduce the engine power to cruise setting. While adjusting the attitude to maintain level flight, recheck the power setting and trim the aircraft. Air density will affect the climb performance of your aircraft. As well as affecting engine performance, it affects the operation of the airspeed indicator. As you gain altitude, the density of the air decreases. This causes the airspeed indicator to record a lower than actual airspeed, although the actual speed of the aircraft may be relatively unaffected. To maintain a relatively accurate rate of climb, use the following rule of thumb. Decrease the recommended indicated sea level climb speed by 1.75% or about 2 miles per hour for every 1,000 foot increase in altitude above sea level. Do not include the first 1,000 feet. Now, apply this rule to the following example. You are flying an aircraft with a recommended normal climb speed of 90 miles an hour. At an indicated altitude of 2,000 feet, adjust the indicated climb speed to 88 miles per hour. It would be adjusted to 85 miles per hour at 3,000 feet. As mentioned, density will affect the performance of the aircraft during the climb. Hot air is less dense than cold air. Humid air has less density than dry air. And air at high elevations is less dense than at lower elevations. To calculate your climb performance, use the density altitude. This is the altitude corresponding to a given density in a standard atmosphere. Flaps are used on some aircraft to shorten the takeoff run and steepen the angle of climb. Consult the aircraft manual for the correct usage. If you do use flaps, do not retract them until your aircraft is in the proper nose-up attitude for a climb and well above any obstacles. Use carburetor heat if there's a risk of icing during the climb. This will reduce the available engine power in the case of full throttle climbs. Under no circumstances should you allow the airspeed to fall below normal climb speed for the aircraft. If you have to, reduce the rate of climb to maintain the airspeed. Climb performance is also affected by the weight of the aircraft. Ground effect may allow the aircraft to leave the runway when fully loaded, but once out of ground effect, the ability of the aircraft to climb may be seriously impaired. Climb performance data in the aircraft manual should be fully reviewed. For a detailed explanation of ground effect, review the VidiGlobe flight training tape on takeoffs. Occasionally, you may find yourself having to balk or pull up from an approach to landing. To enter a climb when the aircraft is in the landing configuration, apply takeoff power promptly and smoothly while putting the aircraft in a nose-up attitude.
will have to visually estimate this attitude if the flaps are fully extended. Since the trim was set for a landing, it is likely the application of power will raise the nose. Be prepared to put forward pressure on the column and readjust the trim for the desired attitude. Retract the flaps gradually and slowly as soon as possible. Each time the flap setting is changed, the trim will have to be readjusted. If you're flying an aircraft with mechanically defined flap settings, retract them one at a time. The next procedure you'll be shown is descending. There are two major groups of descents, power on or power assisted descents and power off or glide descents. These can be categorized further. There are four types of power on descents. They are descents at cruise power setting, descents at cruising airspeed with power reduced to maintain a rate of descent, descents at reduced airspeed and reduced power settings to maintain a rate of descent and airspeed, and descents at reduced airspeed and reduced power settings with flap extended to maintain the angle of descent. Power off descents can be divided into glides without flaps and glides with flaps extended. You can use power off or power on descents to meet the requirements of just about any situation. However, power on descents allow you more flexibility and make it easier to correct any errors in judgment. Gliding is the procedure used to keep an aircraft in the air for as long as possible without power. Practically, the distance covered is more important than the time the aircraft remains aloft. That means establishing an airspeed that gives you the optimum lift-drag ratio attitude of the aircraft. Most aircraft flight manuals include the best glide speed in the maximum glide charts. Commit this airspeed to memory, since the glide type of descent is used in approaches to forced landings. Wind will either increase or decrease the distance you're able to cover at a given attitude. When gliding into the wind, distance is increased by using a higher than normal airspeed. With a tailwind, use a lower than normal airspeed to cover more distance. In an emergency situation, use the recommended best glide speed. Then estimate the range you have. This may be done visually. First, find a reference point on the windshield. This may be a point so many inches up from the instrument panel adjacent to the magnetic compass mark, a mark made by yourself with a china marker, or even a squashed bug. Measure everything in relation to this mark. Now, stabilize the aircraft in a constant power on or power off descent. Keep a steady rate of descent and constant attitude. Now, compare observations on the ground with the mark on your windshield. Positions which appear to move down from the mark are ground positions you can reach and fly over with height to spare. The position on the ground which remains stationary to the mark is the spot your aircraft should reach. Positions that move above the mark are out of range. Now you will be shown how to begin a power off descent from straight and level flight. First, complete all cockpit checks and note the altimeter reading. Check the sky above and below for other aircraft. Reduce power. Keep straight by using the rudder to counter the tendency of the aircraft to yaw right as the power decreases. Allow the airspeed to decrease. Now, assume the approximate attitude for the best glide airspeed and trim. Fine-tune your attitude to reach the proper airspeed and retrim. You should notice a steady decrease on the altimeter. The rate of descent will be displayed on the vertical airspeed indicator. If you should want to return to straight and level flight from a power off descent, use the following procedure. Check the sky ahead and above for other aircraft and note the altimeter rating. Next, bring the power level up to the setting for cruise flight. Get into the cruise attitude and maintain it until the aircraft accelerates to cruise speed. Use the rudder to counter the left yaw produced by the increased power. Now, trim the aircraft. Then adjust the power and flight controls to maintain the desired airspeed and altitude. Retrim as necessary. Here are some pointers to keep in mind for power off descents. Do not allow the engine to cool off too much or it may not respond when the throttle is advanced. Apply cruising power at appropriate intervals to keep the engine temperature near normal. This will also prevent fouling of the spark plugs. Check the flight manual to see if your aircraft requires carburetor heat for power off descents. If you want to precisely control your rate of descent and the distance attained, use a power on descent. 
This type of descent is used in routine descents and approaches to landing. It also helps you meet the speed and spacing requirements of airport traffic circuits. To enter a power on descent, follow these steps. First, reduce the engine power to an RPM setting that will give you the desired airspeed and rate of descent. Allow the airspeed to decrease to that level. Lower the nose to the attitude that gives you the desired rate of descent. Now, trim the aircraft to maintain this attitude. Check the instruments to make sure you have the proper airspeed and rate of descent. If not, adjust power accordingly and retrim. If you want to decrease the rate of descent, increase the power to give you the desired rate. Adjust the attitude to maintain the best descent speed and then retrim. Remember, proper trim is the key to smoothly changing from one attitude or airspeed to another. You may use any combination of airspeed and rate of descent to obtain the effect desired. En route descents are made by reducing the power to give you a suitable rate of descent while maintaining a cruising airspeed. Flaps may be used to alter the angle of descent. A steeper descent gives you better visibility. A high angle of descent usually requires the full extension of flaps and recommended full flap approach airspeed. Flap settings are outlined in the aircraft flight manual. Because flaps increase lift and drag, it is possible to descend at a lower airspeed when they are extended. If you are flying an aircraft with retractable landing gear, you may steepen the angle of descent by extending the landing gear. The angle of descent may also be steepened by descending at a very high or a very low airspeed. However, this is not desirable under most circumstances. Turns are probably the most aerodynamically complicated of basic flying maneuvers. In actual practice for the pilot, the procedure is relatively simple. A number of forces come into play in a turn. The weight of the aircraft and centrifugal force, which pulls the plane away from the radius of the turn, are balanced by two other forces. They are the lift of the wings and the centripetal force which pulls the plane into the radius of the turn. Turns can be classed as gentle, medium, or steep. As well as level turns, there are climbing and descending turns. Normally, climbing turns are gentle. Descending and level turns may be gentle, medium, or steep. A gentle turn is one with a bank angle of less than 15 degrees. Medium turns have bank angles of 15 to 30 degrees, and steep turns have bank angles of greater than 30 degrees. Now you'll be shown what happens when an aircraft is turned. The aircraft is put into a bank attitude to incline the lift. As well as keeping the aircraft aloft, the bank also supplies the necessary centripetal force toward the center of the turn. In a bank, the upper wing creates more drag than the lower wing. This causes the plane to yaw toward the raised wing. Left unchecked, the aircraft will attempt to turn in the wrong direction at first. Use the rudder to control the yaw. Here are some basic principles of turns. At any given airspeed, the greater the bank, the greater the rate of turn, and the smaller the radius of turn. An increased bank also raises the sawing speed and increases the load factor. At a given angle of bank, increasing the airspeed lowers the rate of turn and increases the radius of the turn. To get the greatest rate of turn and smallest radius for a given bank angle, use the lowest possible airspeed for that angle of bank. As you were told, the stalling speed increases with the steepness of the bank. At 30 degrees, the stalling speed will increase by 8% over that of level flight. A 45 degree bank angle increases it by 18 percent. At 60 degrees, it increases by 40 percent. The stalling speed increases by 100 percent at 75 degrees and by 200 percent at 83 degrees. Keep in mind the load factor also increases with the increase in bank angle. Now, let's get you into a level turn. First, check the sky for any other aircraft. You need more than just a casual glance. Check in both directions as well as above and below your aircraft. While making the turn, make sure you're sitting upright. Do not allow your body to lean away from the direction of the turn. Just relax and ride with it. Make sure the plane is flying straight and level before turning. Now, use the ailerons to roll the plane to the desired bank attitude. 
maintain this attitude, and at the same time control any yaw with the rudder. Avoid the temptation to use too much rudder. Remember, only use the rudder to counter the adverse yaw. To maintain the correct pitch, use the elevators. The horizon is your reference point. And keep an eye out for other aircraft throughout the turn. Now, a word about pitch. In gentle turns, the pitch remains about the same as during straight and level flight. But as you increase the bank attitude, you will find it necessary to pull back on the control column to increase the lift. You will also note a loss of airspeed and the need for more power as the bank angle increases. As your aircraft progresses through an accurate turn, you should notice the following. The nose moves steadily around the horizon, neither rising nor falling. The airspeed will remain constant. The instruments will read the following way. The turn indicator will show a constant rate of turn, and the ball will be centered in the glass tube. The altimeter will show a constant altitude. Aileron control will vary according to the bank attitude. In gentle turns, because most aircraft are designed with lateral stability, the plane will attempt to return to straight and level flight. You will find the need for light aileron pressure. But as the bank angle steepens, the ailerons will be needed to maintain the bank angle and prevent the aircraft from rolling. To recover from a turn, first look out for other aircraft. Next, use the ailerons to return the aircraft to level flight. Control adverse yaw with the rudder. Maintain your pitch with the elevator, keep the aircraft straight, and look out for other traffic. Now, trim the aircraft. Climbing and descending turns are made in a similar manner to level turns, but there are some differences. Obviously, instead of maintaining a constant altitude, you are climbing or descending. There are also some differences in power requirements and attitude control. When you make a climbing turn, you will need additional power to reach the higher altitude. Refer to the earlier portion of this tape on climbing for information on attitude. In descending turns, power can be reduced from the cruise level to the throttle fully closed. Again, review the portion of this tape dealing with descending for further information on attitude. Recovery from climbing and descending turns is the same as for level turns. Power off descending turns are important because you may find yourself having to execute one in a forced landing situation. The controls are less responsive than when in a power on turn. When recovering from a power off descent, decrease the pressure on the elevator to avoid pitching up and losing too much airspeed. As well, you will have to sacrifice more altitude in a power off descending turn in order to keep up the airspeed. Steep turns require you to coordinate all three flight controls and the power control. This gives you a means of turning quickly in a relatively small area and are generally only used in emergency situations. As the bank increases beyond 30 degrees, you will need more power to maintain airspeed. Now that's because the greater the angle of the bank, the more lift required to maintain a constant attitude. The increased lift also produces more drag, thus the need for more power to maintain a constant airspeed. The bank angle that can be maintained in a steep turn is dependent upon the available engine power. You enter a steep turn like any other turn, but it requires the simultaneous coordination of all of the controls. And because you're turning faster, your lookout for other aircraft is more important than ever. As your angle of bank increases beyond 30 degrees, pull back on the control column to maintain pitch. You will need to increase the power to keep your airspeed up. Once you have reached the desired bank angle, maintain it with the ailerons. The rudder is used to control any yaw that develops, and you will notice the elevator loses its effectiveness as the bank angle increases. To recover from a steep turn, follow the steps previously outlined for level turns. The only difference is that you must reduce the power simultaneously as you return to straight and level flight. To get into a minimum radius turn, first check the sky for any other traffic. Then get your aircraft into the attitude and airspeed for endurance in straight and level flight. Now enter the turn as before. Some things to watch out for. If the bank becomes too steep, the plane slips toward the center of the turn and the nose pitches down. If this is not quickly corrected, the turn can develop into a spiral and the consequences could be fatal. If the nose pitches too far down, 
Low level and pull back on the control column to raise the nose. Slipping turns are used when you must lose height during the turn on final approach to the runway. In this maneuver, the yaw induced by the bank is partially prevented by using the opposite rudder. A standard rate turn is made at the rate of three degrees per second. The rate at which your aircraft turns is determined by the airspeed and bank angle. Here is a simple formula to estimate the angle of bank required for a standard rate of turn. Take 10% of the airspeed, then add seven to the remainder. If your airspeed is 130 knots, 10% is 13. Add seven to that and it totals 20. Therefore, you would need 20 degrees of bank for a standard rate turn at 130 knots. The final section of this tape deals with range and endurance. When an aircraft is flown for range, you are trying to get the greatest distance per unit of fuel. That means the aircraft must be flown at the optimum lift-drag ratio. This is the airspeed which gives you the most lift with the least drag. The flight manual of your aircraft should have cruise performance charts which give airspeeds for optimum range. Keep in mind these figures are for still air, so you still have to account for wind. When flying into the wind, use a higher range power setting than recommended. When you fly for endurance, you're trying to keep the aircraft in the air for the longest possible time per unit of fuel consumed. The distance covered is of no importance. You would fly for endurance if you had to wait for a runway to be cleared of snow or if you were waiting for the weather to clear. Most light aircraft can double their time in the air per unit of fuel when operated in the endurance mode. The power level for endurance is the lowest setting that sustains level flight. To find it, reduce the power in small amounts while maintaining your altitude. The angle of attack will have to be increased as you reduce the airspeed you will reach a level where power must be increased to maintain flight. The power setting you notice just before this point is the setting for best endurance. Immediately increase the power and then reduce it in small increments until reaching the RPM necessary to keep the aircraft in level flight. Now, take time for this quick review. During a power off descent, why is it necessary to periodically increase the power to full power? This is necessary to keep the engine at near normal operating temperature, otherwise it may fail to respond properly when the throttle is opened. Why would the flaps be extended when descending at a constant air speed? You would extend the flaps to steepen the angle of descent. When going into or recovering from a turn, why is the rudder used? The rudder is used to counter any adverse yaw produced during this maneuver. Why must power be added during a constant altitude steep turn? In a steep turn, the extra power is needed to maintain airspeed.